stand and sing nothing but the blood 212. start off a new week and uh, serve the Lord this week and looking forward to a lot of things. Let me give you a couple uh, prayer requests if I could. Uh, continue to pray for Barry Booth uh, where he had fallen uh, before. He's still having some problems with his hip. And then uh, uh, Sharon called me this morning, Sharon Mullins, and we need to pray for their daughter Beatrice Armel. Uh, she has uh, a large blood clot in her lung. She was in critical care uh, Friday, uh, she's been on our prayer list for a while, uh, but she was in critical care Friday. They wasn't sure that she was going to make it, uh, but now she, uh, I guess this morning, they just put her in a step down. But we need to continue to pray uh, for them and uh, pray that God will give the family grace uh, going through this time as well. So uh, let's go ahead and pray for these individuals, and uh, then we'll, I'll give you a couple of announcements here. Father, we thank you. That, Lord, we can come to you in prayer, and we're thankful, Lord, that you are a gracious and merciful God. And, Father, we just pray for uh, Barry. We pray, uh, I think, even of Jenny. We didn't mention her, but where she had fallen and, and uh, hurt her ankle. Uh, pray for them. Help them to heal from their fall. But, Lord, I pray also for Beatrice and ask, Lord, that you will uh, just watch over her, be with the Mullins while they're down there. Thank you, Lord, for traveling mercies. And pray, Lord, that you would just... Uh, bless as only you can. Lord, we don't know exactly uh, what needs to be done, but we know you're the great physician and you're able to heal to the uttermost. And we just ask that, Lord, if it be thy will, that you might do that. Thank you so much for the blessings of the day. Pray you bless our service in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 
All right, a couple announcements to let you know about. Uh, we do have a sign-up sheet uh, for the shower for this Saturday. Elizabeth's having a bridal shower. Now, is there a sheet in the other building, too? Okay, so we probably need to get one over there. Um, but uh, there is a sign-up sheet if you're planning on going to the shower this Saturday so we know about how many to plan for. And then also, I'd like to thank uh, all of those who helped with the uh, mother-daughter banquet Friday. Uh, we had some men help out with that, and also uh, all those who helped set up everything and get the stuff together. And uh, It really, it was a little rough start because we had, the, I think everybody who helped with the food, uh, we all had food issues, but it all came together eventually. Uh, everybody got to eat, and I think the ladies had a great time, and uh, the guys enjoyed the time of fellowship we had. So anyway, thank you all for helping make that uh, a success. And I don't know how many ladies total we have, probably 65, I think, roughly around there somewhere. Um, but anyway, it's a great group of ladies we had. Um, we do have team meeting tonight, team meeting at 630, and so young people make a note of that. And let's see here, looking at uh, some other things. Now, next Sunday evening, we are going to observe the Lord's Supper uh, after the uh, evening service. And so if you would, just uh, be expecting that. And then coming up in a couple weeks, we have our uh, mothers. We're going to celebrate Mother's Day and uh, looking forward to that as well. And we always try to give a little gift, a little uh, present there for our ladies, uh, the mothers here in our church. And I'm excited about that. Now, we'll be traveling the week, actually a couple days right before that. We'll be traveling, I think, Thursday and coming back. Uh, Saturday because uh, Andrew and Elizabeth uh, have graduation uh, that Friday, so we'll be down there for a little bit. Um, do we have any other any other college students graduating? This is the they graduate earlier than the high school students do. Any, anybody else know of any? Okay, so I don't want to miss those because um, that's a nice accomplishment for them to get that finished up. Uh, and then uh, there's a few dates there in the bulletin uh, for Cold Wars coming up in a hurry. Uh, and then uh, junior camp and teen camp. And then I'd like to remind you this week, uh, Brother Nate Beam is going to be here, not with us, but he's going to be our guest here at the Prophet's Chamber uh, starting tomorrow. And he's going to be preaching revival services at Preacher John's Church there in Hinton. So if you uh, would like to go out to that, then I uh, want to make that available to you. I think the service starts at 7 out there. <laughs> 7 o'clock, so that's Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday uh, that he will be out there. And let's see, uh, we do have a deacons meeting. We'll have a, have, uh, need to have a deacons meeting this Saturday at 10 o'clock. We're going to probably try to just schedule a couple here as we have a few things we'd like to get, uh, get done as we get into some warmer weather. And, uh, uh, and then there's a couple little tidbits here, a couple little tidbits of some facts. I didn't know if you knew this. I put them in the bulletin. But I think I better read it to you because nobody reads the bulletin anymore. <laughs> the human brain is 60% fat. Did you know that? Now, see, I like useless pieces of information like that. Yeah, that's just a little trivia stuff. Anybody else like little pieces of information? Okay, a few people. Like, you know, your brain's 60% fat. That's a reason I don't want to go on a diet. So <laughs> I thought that was interesting. And then uh, I did not know this. Some of you history guys might have known this, but New York was briefly named New Orange. Anybody know that before? I didn't know that. I never heard it before. Uh, the Dutch captured it from the English in 1673 in honor of William III of Orange. The following year, the English regained control, and they dropped the orange of the name. So that was kind of a, that'd be odd to have a city called New Orange. But anyway, I just thought I'd throw those in there. Uh, those are a little interesting pieces of information. Also, be planning, we have, uh, we're going to be making a trip to uh, the mission in Columbus uh, here around the middle of May sometime. So if you have food items, please bring the food items in. Uh, you can bring in canned food items, or if you'd like to get uh, some Sam's cards or Walmart gift cards, uh, they can go, uh, you know, to the store and get whatever it is they need. Uh, they are having a difficult time. Uh, Columbus, of course, is been in a state of chaos, I think, for a while, um, but uh, having that shooting here uh, this past week did not help matters much, but uh, it's making it hard on folks there at the mission, and Dave mentioned in Sunday school 
uh, the ladies' home that they have. They're trying to get everything finalized with that. They have some people, I think a few ladies waiting to go into that. Uh, but they have some property and they're trying, uh, they're just city folks and they're trying to get, uh, they're trying to have a little garden. They have a pig they bought. They named the pig. I guess they're planning on slaughtering the pig, which obviously is not a good idea. Uh, but the, you know, they're going to learn a lot of things. Now, something that you might be able to do if you'd like to make a trip up there sometime, they can tell you where the ladies' home is. They can probably use some help uh, even getting a garden started and getting some tidbits on how to do things because a lot of them have never done anything like that before. And uh, so they're just trying, uh, trying to do their best they can. Uh, I think they, last year or the year before that, they had... Uh, they were just overgrown with weeds, had weeds growing up right next to the house, and uh, didn't realize, you know, snakes and everything's going to come in if they're not careful. So just a lot of things that they're learning on the fly, uh, but they can use some help. So if you'd like to make a trip up there and just kind of see uh, how the work's going and maybe try to be a blessing in the process, uh, that would be something I think would be good. We can get uh, the details of that worked out there for you. Well, we're going to have uh, uh, a couple things going on this morning. Uh, we have, uh, the ladies are going to sing a special here in just a little bit. We're going to get ready to take up our offering uh, here in just a moment. But uh, also, because of COVID, COVID's kind of put us behind. We've been dealing with this now for a year. It's put us behind a little bit in our paperwork. But I have some baptismal certificates. Some of these are just over a year old. Some of them were from this last year. Uh, but I have some of those. I'm going to try to pass out. I think I've got everybody separated out. There's a few of the young people over in the other building. Uh, that uh, we won't be able to get them. And then we have a couple seniors that have not been here for a while because of the COVID. Uh, we'll wait and give them their certificate whenever they come. But these are the baptismal certificates we have. So anyway, we'll be doing that right before the message. So if I can get a couple of ushers to come, we will prepare for our uh, Sunday morning. I'll get the right service here, the Sunday morning offering. <clears throat> And you give as God has prospered you, and give back unto the Lord. We're going to ask Byron if he'd mind coming and praying for the offering, please. Dear Lord, thank you for the wonderful day you've given to us and for allowing us to be here again today. And I pray for all the prayer requests and those who are homesick. Pray you'll heal them according to your will. Pray you'll bless our service today and, and save the lost. In Jesus' name, amen. another announcement I forgot. Uh, Elizabeth has a sign-up sheet in the back of the building here and over in the other building. If you are if you are planning on going to the wedding, if you would just put your, uh, that's June 12th, if you would put your name down and then if you would like an invitation. She has a, a limited number of invitations, but if you'd like an invitation, you can circle yes or no on there. And then she'll probably need to make sure she has your address. I think I have most of the addresses of folks here in the church. But uh, if you're planning on going to the wedding, uh, then that would help us out a great deal. Uh, 
uh, on that sheet. So you'll see the sheet back here on the table. And then also, uh, I'd like to welcome Dale and Tammy Irvin. They're in the other building over there, so uh, it's good having them here in our service. And I know you all can't see them, but uh, uh, I went over and saw them anyway. I saw them before I came over here, but it's good having them here in our service. Uh, we're going to have another song here in just a second, so let's all stand and sing, and Jody will tell us what page number we have. 125. Jesus paid it all. 125. <laughs> certificates first and then uh, we will have the ladies come and sing a special. Uh, I'd also like to welcome to our Sunday morning service uh, Aaron and Tara Helmick. They've been, they visited with us a couple of Wednesday nights but this is their first Sunday here so uh, good having them here in our service. Uh, let me get the certificates here. Now, once I call your name if you would just come up and, and get your certificate and and I appreciate these folks uh, following the Lord in believer's baptism. Of course, uh, it's not the baptism that saves you. It's the faith in Jesus Christ. And uh, we know that, and we try to always reinforce that because so many people uh, get uh, some things in the Scriptures confused. I'll talk a little bit about that this morning in the message. But uh, I'm proud of these folks for just obeying the Lord. Uh, some of them have been saved for a while, and, uh, and then they've gotten baptized, they realized, hey, you know, I need to make sure I get this in the right order and get this taken care of. So glad they did that, and I pray that uh, God will continue to bless them and help them to grow in the faith. Uh, so if, let's see, let's go ahead here. Brianna Yop, if you would, come on up. I think most of the ones I have here, uh, I'm looking around to make sure I don't overlook anybody that I have their certificate for. And then uh, Linda Bogus. And Noel Bogus and Luke Bogus. Congratulations. Congratulations. And then Kelsey Gillespie, Cassie Miller, and Corey Miller. Department. Uh, I have 
Timothy, uh, Timmy Pennington's and Jaden, and then uh, the Spencer's. I'm trying to think of who else I have. Uh, Josh, I don't see him here this morning. I have his as well. But anyway, we'll get those maybe tonight uh, for those that will be over here in our service. But ladies, if you would, come on up, and they're going to sing a special for us, and we'll get everything set up here for them. Then I'll bring the message from God's Word. Looking forward to that time until we meet again. There's going to be a grand reunion in the sky. Well, take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 17. Acts, chapter 17. We're going to be uh, looking at, actually this morning and tonight, looking at a similar topic, but just from a little bit different perspective. And I'd like to remind also our young people or parents, I know that our young people aren't in here right now, but if they have some verses from Masters Club, uh, some things to say, they can say those tonight. And uh, we may also, just to prepare you, we may have a little time of testimony uh, time tonight. I always enjoy testimony time. Try to get uh, testimony time in You know, every couple months or so. It's good for us to be able to give praises about... Uh, answered prayer or just maybe something we're thankful for, something that God has done in our hearts and lives. But uh, Acts chapter 17 and verse number 22 is where I begin reading. 
It says, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all <coughs> nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device, in the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Now, a couple things I'd like to draw your attention to just to explain here. When it says here in verse 28 and also verse 29, talking about us being the offspring of God, this does not mean that we are all the children of God. That phrase there simply means that we are created in God's image. We are all created in God's image, every man, woman, and child. It talks about in a few verses before that, that uh, there is one blood, that we are all, uh, there's not one race better than another race. We're all one blood as far as in God's eyes and uh, when Adam and Eve were created, they had the mixture of all the races in them. And then down through the years, as time had gone on, uh, the races actually got a little bit more divided. And we sing the song in children's church, red and yellow, black and white. Notice there are four of them, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. Well, the reason there's red and yellow, black and white is because a man carries two genes and a woman carries two genes. And when you put those together, that's where the four main races come from. And, of course, you have a little, uh, little bit of a mixture uh, that's in there from all that. But there are four main races, just like there's four main uh, hair collars, there's four main eye collars, uh, there's four main everything because it all comes from Adam and Eve. So we are all related in one extent. But the thing I would like to draw your attention to here, and this is what was going on in the passage, is the people here, uh, even though they understood they were created by God, they were ignorantly worshiping idols made of silver and gold and stone. They were <laughs> worshiping things made with man's hands. And they were doing it ignorantly. And that is what Paul points out here in verse uh, 30. He says, in the times of this ignorance, God winked at. Now, I've simply been titled this message, Ignorance. You know, ignorance... And stupidity are not the same thing. Ignorance can be fixed. Ignorance is simply not knowing something. Uh, there's a lot of philosophers who have made comments over the years about ignorance. And then there are some, some things that we have heard over the years about ignorance that are not true. But ignorance can be fixed. Now there are some things in the Bible that we're going to look at here that are important and they relate to ignorance. And then tonight we're going to look at some things that God has clearly said that we are not to be ignorant of. There are some things that we are clearly to be doing and clearly to be aware of uh, that has been laid out for us in the scriptures and is there for our benefit and for the benefit of others. The problem with so much, uh, the, the troubles and things we see in Christianity today is simply due to this one thing, ignorance. And remember that ignorance can be fixed. And I hope if you find yourself ignorant in any one of these areas that I'm going to mention, that you will fix it here this morning and make a decision for the Lord. Let's go to God in prayer, and then we'll look at some uh, things here from the scriptures 
about this subject of ignorance. Father, we thank you so much for the word of God. And we're thankful, Lord. It is quick. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And Lord, I'm thankful for each one of us that's able to be here this morning and those who are able to watch uh, in the other building, those who are watching on Facebook and will watch on YouTube later. Lord, I pray that we will receive a special blessing. Lord, we need to hear from heaven this morning. We need to hear from you. And Father, we all have a responsibility for how we hear. And Lord, I pray that you help us to be hearers of the word. And help us also to be doers of what we hear. Father, I pray that we will uh, apply these things to our hearts and lives. And Lord, if there be one in our service that does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, they might be a religious person, they might be a good moral person. But Lord, if they have never made that decision like you told Nicodemus, they have never been born again. Lord, I pray that this morning they will do that before it's eternally too late. Father, we pray for the Christian here this morning as well. Help us to realize we ourselves have a responsibility to guard against ignorance. And Father, we ask these things now and pray all this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you look in verse, he talks about their ignorance in verse number 30. And then notice what he says in verse 31. He says, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, and that's speaking of Jesus Christ, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. So verse 31 is saying God is, expects us to fix our ignorance. He expects us to do something about it. Why? Because we are all going to stand before God someday. The Bible tells us every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess to God that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, if you are a Christian, you're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ will take place during that time of tribulation that is going to take place here on the earth. It's known as the time of Jacob's trouble. It's a seven-year period of time, but the church will be raptured out of here. At that time, when the tribulation is going on here on the earth, we will be standing at the judgment seat of Christ. We will give an account for every work that we have done. The Bible says that we're going to be tried for our works. Now, some of our works, depending on why we did what we did, are going to be burned up. They're going to be made of wood, hay, and stubble. If we did it to be seen of men, it's going to be burned up. If we did it for any earthly purpose or any earthly gain, it's going to be burned up. But the things that we did that's, that was for the Lord and it was with the right motive and it was not so we get the glory but so that God gets the glory... Those things are going to be made out of wood, hay, and, or not wood, hay, and stubble, but gold, silver, and precious stone, and they will abide the fire, and they will be the things that will last, and that is what God is going to use to determine if we have earned crowns, if we've earned a crown of righteousness, if we've earned a soul winner's crown, if we've earned other crowns, and those crowns we will be able to cast at the feet of Jesus because he is worthy. But we're all going to be tried. Those people who are not saved, and those people who go through the tribulation time, they're going to have to stand at what is known as the great white throne judgment. Now, we will be there present, but that will not be our judgment. That will be their judgment. But we all are going to have to give an account of what we do. And the Bible says in verse 30, the times of this ignorance God winked at. He says, look, there was a time when God let a few things slip. Because the people were not made aware of certain things. But now that we have the complete revelation of God's word, from Genesis all the way through Revelation, we're told in the book of Romans that every man will be without excuse. We all are going to be held responsible for what we know and what we do with what we know. Now, ignorance simply means to not know something. And the way you fix that is to know about it. You learn about it. There are some false views about ignorance. You probably have heard these sayings before. What you don't know, what's the rest of it? Can't hurt you. That's a false view of ignorance. What you don't know can't hurt you. Well, that's not obviously true because little children, they get hurt all the time and that's how they learn. They touch a burning stove. Ouch. They didn't know it was going to burn them, but guess what? It did hurt them. You see, so ignorance there 
as that, that statement about ignorance is obviously not true. There's also another statement called ignorance is bliss. That means sometimes it's better off not knowing certain things. Well, that's not a true statement either. If this building was on fire, uh, obviously ignorance is not bliss. You know, ignorance would be a bad thing in that situation. Uh, it's good for us to know certain things. I like a, a couple of these phrases here. Benjamin Franklin said this. He said, being ignorant is not so much a shame as being unwilling to learn. Now, that's a shame. You can't teach an old dog new tricks? Baloney. I don't care how old the dog is, they can still learn new tricks. One of the most valuable things we ought to always strive to keep in our Christian life is a teachable spirit. We ought to be willing to learn from the Holy Spirit of God. I like what this philosopher said. You may not have heard of this guy. I've never heard of him before. This is a philosopher from the late 1800s. His name is Elbert Hubbard. And he said this. He said, the recipe for perpetual ignorance is be satisfied with your opinions and content with your knowledge. You know what the problem is with many Christians today? They're satisfied with their opinions. And you know what the problem is? Their, their opinion doesn't matter. And my opinion doesn't matter. What matters is what the Word of God says. That's the only thing that matters. And we're going to see about how ignorance applies to this here in just a moment. But ignorance can be fixed with knowledge. Now, there are some things that we might be ignorant of. You know, when we first moved here, I, I thought it was a big deal. I had never driven a tractor in my life. Now, some of you think that's not a big deal because that's what you grew up on. I'm talking, I've never even been on a lawn tractor before. <laughs> I thought, man, this is, this. is I'm farming now. I'm on a lawn tractor. <laughs> and then uh, the Bridges, Jim and Miss Laura, they allowed us to do some gardening over there. And uh, Jim has been, he had taught me quite a bit as uh, we were learning. We tried to have a garden in Tennessee. And uh, kind of like, because we, we're just, you know, we grew up in the city. That's all we knew. Uh, we're kind of like those folks at the mission. You know, we thought you just kind of dig up the dirt, throw some seed in the ground, water it a little bit, and uh, pretty much that's it. And every once in a while you pull some weeds or something. Little did we know anything about soil, uh, soil temperature, all this stuff. And I remember planting, I planted a whole bunch of tomato seeds. And I was talking to a guy I worked with, and he was telling me how to grow these tomato seeds. And uh, he says, you know, you just do this and this and this. And I planted all these tomato seeds, and I stuck them outside so they get plenty of sun, because there's a lot of sun in Tennessee. I thought, man, these things are going to get a lot of sun. And I waited and waited. A week went by, and there was nothing. You see, I didn't know the soil temperature made a big difference. It was still kind of cool out at the time. And finally, I just said, I don't know what to do with these, so I stuck them in my old car. And I had the windows rolled up. Well, there's no shade on the windows. And guess what happened to the temperature inside that car? It went up. That soil temperature in that, that little pot that I had, that little plant thing where I had all those things planted, that soil temperature went up. And as soon as that went up, it was just a day or two, those things were standing that tall. And I thought, man, I'm, I'm a gardener now. I can grow something. So I put them back out on the porch, and I made sure that those, I read somewhere that they needed a lot of water. So I kept watering and watering and watering, and I got down to one plant left. I killed them all. I watered them to death, didn't know anything, and I put that one plant in the ground, and I thought, man, that plant, it's just going to die. And it kind of fell over, and it was looking pretty bad for about a week or so, and then it kind of came up, and it started growing a little bit, never did get any tomatoes on it. It ended up dying itself, but, you know, we didn't know anything. And I remember Jim telling me, he would, he would tell me to do this and tell me to do that, and, and finally he just says, well, he said, I don't mean any disrespect, he goes, but you're pretty dumb. <laughs> I said, well, I don't know. You've got to tell me. I said, you just have to tell me what to do. I said, I'll learn eventually. And uh, so we've learned some things through trial and error. But you know, ignorance can be fixed. But let me give you some things here in the Bible that we sometimes are ignorant of. Turn, if you would, to the book of Matthew, chapter 22. Matthew 22. There are some things we ought not be ignorant of because it presents problems. 
And like I said, tonight we're going to look at some things that God says that we are to not be ignorant of. But let me give you some things here that cause some problems because of ignorance. Matthew 22, and we'll start reading here in verse 23. It says, The same day came him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him. Now, I taught our school the Bible class. You see, you had two main religious groups in this day. You had the Sadducees and you had the Pharisees. The Pharisees, of course, believe in a resurrection, but the Sadducees don't believe in a resurrection. Now, how can you remember which one is which? Well, without the resurrection, guess what? You're still in your sin. You're still lost. There's no Savior without the resurrection. So you are sad, you see. That's an easy way to remember what they believe. And the Sadducees came to them. They did not believe in a resurrection. And they said in verse 24, they said, Master, Moses said, If a man die, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, which they don't believe, therefore in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Now what were they ignorant of? They were ignorant of the scriptures. They were ignorant of the power of God. He says, ye be heir, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Now, if you've ever had a question back in Genesis chapter 6 about who the sons of God are in Genesis chapter 6, I can tell you this is one of many reasons why they are not angels. Uh, over in the book of Job, the sons of God are mentioned as angels, but in Genesis chapter 6, they are not angels. And the reason is because they do not have physical relations with mankind. Now, that's just a little side note there for you. But we are uh, in the resurrection, Jesus said, they neither marry nor are given a marriage, but are, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead but of the living. You see, they err, they were in error, why? Because they did not know the scriptures. Why do so many Christians fall prey to the devil? Because they don't know the scriptures. Why do so many people have a false view of heaven? Because they don't know the scriptures. I've been asked the question so many times, why are there so many different types of churches? Why do we have churches that teach this and churches that teach that and churches that teach this? I'll tell you why. Because as a whole, we do not know the scriptures. We are told to sit down and rightly divide the word of truth. When we find something in the word of God, sometimes people will take a doctrine it's just like, uh, I'll talk a little bit about this tonight, about uh, you know, some people who were in more of a charismatic movement. And they use 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 talking about speaking in tongues. But what they don't know is the book of 1 Corinthians was a letter of rebuke to the church. It was not a letter of praise. And what they were doing was wrong. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 are all dealing with the correct way to use spiritual gifts. And yes, there are spiritual gifts. And there was a correct way to do it. And the church of Corinth was doing it all wrong. Why? Because they did not know the scriptures. There are so many churches today that uh, there are some churches that teach you have to be baptized to be saved. Why? Because they do not know the scriptures. There's about six verses in the Bible, six passages in the Bible that do, I'm just going to be honest with you, they do seem to teach that you have to be baptized to be saved. One of the most obvious is Mark 16, 16. It says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now that seems very obvious. But you see, until you take that verse 
and you take it with the other five passages that seem to teach that, and you weigh it all with the entire Word of God, you're never going to completely and correctly understand the passage, what it's talking about. So many people do not, that, uh, they do not know the Scriptures, they're ignorant of the Scriptures, and therefore they err and they get out into false doctrine. So being ignorant of the Scriptures will lead us to false doctrine, just like the Sadducees. It is important to know all of the Bible, not just bits and pieces. When people start reading the Bible, I always try to encourage them uh, to start in somewhere in the New Testament. Uh, you can start in Psalms, Proverbs, whatever you do, I, I just strongly suggest you not start in the book of Genesis. That's probably not a good idea. There's a lot of meat in the Old Testament you're not ready for. It. Matter of fact, you might have to read through the New Testament a couple times before you're ready to handle a little bit of the meat in the Old Testament. There's a lot of meat there, but guess what? Everything in the Old Testament is still profitable. How do we know that? Turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. This was written to a young preacher by the name of Timothy. Paul was writing this here to encourage him. Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 16. <clears throat> Actually, let me back up here uh, to verse 14. Let me back up a little bit further. <laughs> verse 12. It says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now these evil men and seducers that he's talking about here are false teachers. They're false prophets. They're people who claim the name of Christ, but they don't know what they're talking about. Sometimes they're, they're proud in their intellect, but they're not led by the Spirit of God. They are evil men and seducers. And not only are they deceiving other people, they themselves are deceived. You know what the amazing thing about being deceived is? You don't know you're deceived. That's the whole thing about it. That's why the devil, he is a master liar. He's a master deceiver. He lies to us. Our hearts are even deceitful, the Bible tells us in Jeremiah 17, verse 9 and 10. Our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. But notice what happens here in verse 14. He says, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. You see, Timothy was not ignorant of the scriptures. Thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise into salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture, everything, even those long names in first, uh, first Chronicles, those first ten chapters, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is what? Profitable. All scripture. What about those hard to understand passages? It's still profitable. Sometimes you may not fully understand it. You're not going to be able to read through the Bible one time and get it. Yeah. You're going to have to read through the Bible time and time and time and time again. And you're always going to be learning something. About your 30th time through, things are going to, you're going to really get a good understanding, a bigger picture of what's going on. But guess what? The Holy Spirit of God is still going to teach you and instruct you. Because the Word of God is rich. It's profitable. What's it profitable for? Look at verse 16. He says it is profitable for doctrine, it's profitable for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. That means mature. The man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. You see, God's word is very powerful. We must always consider confusing passages when we think about Scripture. You're going to come to a passage... And there's going to be times when you're going to think there's a contradiction. I remember when I first started reading the Bible. I grew up believing. Now, I was saved at this time. I was already saved. But I grew up believing, well, the Bible does not apply to us today because it was written over 2,000 years ago. And times change. Oh, how little do I know. Times change, but God's Word does not change. God's Word never changes. And God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I thought, well, you know, the Bible doesn't apply to us today because there are so many contradictions in the Bible. 
Now, when I started reading the Bible, here's what I did. I said, Lord, I don't want to know man's opinion because man's opinion doesn't matter. My opinion doesn't even matter. I want you to instruct me from the Bible, and I'm going to start reading. And if I find one contradiction, I'm going to throw this Bible away, and I'm never going to pick it up again. Because I want something I can depend on 100% beyond any shadow of a doubt. And I'm going to be honest with you. There were many times as I started in the book of Matthew, and there were many times as I started reading, I would get over into some of the other Gospels, and I thought, oh, I found a contradiction. And then I thought, well, maybe I'm not fully understanding that passage because I haven't read the whole Bible yet. So, Lord, if this is not a contradiction, I need you to explain it to me. And you know what the amazing thing was I found? And I'm telling you, this happened time and time and time and time again. God's word always explains itself. Somewhere along the line. Now, there were some things I thought was an obvious contradiction, and I had been reading my Bible for about 14 years, and I still did not understand the confusing passage. And I kept praying about it, saying, Lord, how does that passage make sense? I know now your word is true because you have proven yourself to me. Your word is true. Let God be true and every man a liar. I know your word is true. I need you to instruct me in this. And I kept praying. Every time I would come across that passage... Lord, I still don't understand that. Will you help me understand it? And then one day, the light bulb click, click, just clicked on. Boom, there it is. And I thought, oh, and then God started giving me other scriptures to explain that. And I thought, man, why did I not see that before? You see, they do err not knowing the scriptures. Ignorance can be fixed. But don't think you have the Bible figured out. If you've read through the whole thing once or twice, when you get through the whole Bible about 200 times and then you think you have it figured out and you think you found some issues, come talk to me. We'll discuss some things about it. But we err not knowing the scriptures. Ignorance can be fixed. How do we fix that? Get in the word of God. Being ignorant of God's righteousness keeps us from getting saved. If, we're, if now we're already saved, obviously this does not apply to us, but turn to the book of Romans chapter 10. Being ignorant of God's righteousness can keep somebody from getting saved. The book of Romans is a wonderful book about how we are saved by faith. But Romans chapter 10, Paul is speaking here about the nation of Israel. Verse number 1 says this, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God but not according to knowledge. That means they're ignorant. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Now there's a lot of key things here in this passage. But they were ignorant of God's righteousness. And they, because of that, they went about to establish their own righteousness. And why did they do that? Because they were not submitted to the righteousness of God. You know what some people's problem is? And they call themselves that they claim to be a Christian. But genuinely, they've never been born again. Why? Because they have yet to submit to the righteousness of God. They have yet to submit to a holy God who will not tolerate sin. Dave touched a little bit on that this morning about Samson. Uh, how God is not going to tolerate our sin. He does not tolerate sin. And some people will not get saved because the righteousness which was of the law, the righteousness that was in the law, was to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Those were the two great commandments. And all of the Old Testament was to teach <laughs> us we could not earn our righteousness by keeping the law, but that law was there to perfect our love toward God, and it was there to perfect our love toward our fellow man. And Israel missed it. And I'm talking about Israel as a nation, not as individuals in the nation Israel. But they did not get saved. Why? Because they did not understand. They were ignorant of the righteousness which is taught in the word of God. 
It's important for us to submit to the authority of God. But turn, if you would, to 2 Peter. This is one last one here I'd like you to see. 2 Peter chapter number 3. Being ignorant of the scriptures will lead us to false doctrine. Being ignorant of God's righteousness can keep us from getting saved. Being ignorant on purpose will condemn us. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse number 3. Notice how he starts out here. He says, knowing this first. If you know something, you're not ignorant of it. He says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. Now, what's a scoffer? A scoffer is someone who is going to mock or make fun of people who are trying to do right. I can't tell you how many times I've come across people who claim to be a good person, but yet they don't go to church because of all the hypocrites. I mean, I hear that argument over and over and over again. Where else are hypocrites supposed to go? They ought to be in church. That's how you quit being a hypocrite. You can be a hypocrite in church or a hypocrite out of church. At least some of these people are trying. Now, there are some people who come to church and who generally aren't trying, but that's between them and God. That should not affect what I do for God. That should not affect what you do for God. Being ignorant, though, on purpose will condemn us. Look what he says here. He says, in the last days there shall come scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? I thought you said the Lord was coming back soon. Where is he at? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. What is it saying here that they were willingly ignorant of? They were willingly ignorant of two things. They were willingly ignorant of creation. Now there's a big push in our school systems today and in colleges today about uh, and you hear this with the COVID virus. You know, believe the science. Believe the science. And I remember someone posted something on Facebook. You might have seen it uh, about some of the science here in just the past uh, 50 to 100 years. And they were talking about how good. I'm thankful that there's DDT that we can use. I'm thankful that my home is made of asbestos. All these advertisements. Well, that was the science of the day. But we know now that science was false. There's a lot of science out there that is simply false. Why? Because it wasn't science. It was man's opinion, and they didn't know all the facts yet. So they were just basing it on opinion. That's why a lot of times, even in a medical profession, uh, it's called the practice of medicine. Because it's not an exact science. The human body is amazing. It's, we're created in such a wonderful way. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, and every person's body, everybody, everybody's body is not the same. You can give a drug for one thing, and this person may react one way, this person may react another. Why? Because our bodies are different. God created us in a unique, wonderful way. But there's this teaching that goes against creation. Now, can I prove to you that creation is, is true? Can I prove that to you? No. It's something that we observe by faith. But can you prove evolution is true? Can you prove we came from a rock? It rained on the rocks for millions of years. Can you prove that? Can you recreate that in the laboratory? No, it is faith. Matter of fact, I think it takes more faith to believe in evolution than it does creation. We have so many things around us that we don't understand. We can't, the human eyeball is so complex. It is more complex than the space shuttle. All the electrical circuitry that goes in the space shuttle. Our human eyeball. Still things we don't understand about. It. It's an amazing thing. But these people were willingly ignorant of creation, but they were also willingly ignorant of the worldwide flood. The earth being out of the water and in the water, and then being overflowed with water. 
We have evidence of a natural disaster all across this world known as a flood. The flood was not a local event. It was a worldwide event. Every high hill, every mountain was covered. You say even Mount Everest? Why well, I would dare say if you go back and study your Bible, there was not a Mount Everest at the time. You see, when the waters were assuaging, back after it rained on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, water shot up from beneath, water came pouring down from above, because there was more than likely a canopy of water that surrounded the earth. It had not rained on the earth for over 1,500 years since the day of creation. They didn't know what it was when Noah said it's going to rain. It's going to fall from the sky. Being warned of God of things not seen as yet. They had not seen rain. They didn't understand what he was talking about. So they didn't believe him. Why is this crazy guy building a huge boat on dry ground? Nowhere near water. But when the rains came, how many people do you think beat on that ark then? They were believers then, but then it was too late. And there's evidence all over the world. The Grand Canyon is a beautiful picture of a worldwide flood. And you know what scientists say? Scientists say that that, I think, what's the river that flows to that? The Colorado River, is that what it is? They say the Colorado River carved that canyon out. Well, those people who say that obviously aren't too intelligent. Let me tell you why. Because water does not flow uphill. The top of that canyon is almost 4,000 feet above where the river enters the canyon. How did the top of that canyon get carved out? The water didn't go like this and start carving it out and work its way down. It didn't do that. There was probably a huge lake from a worldwide flood that covered most of the United States. And just like when Mount St. Helens erupted and that lake backed up, and once that lake got full, it carved a miniature Grand Canyon out in a matter of minutes. Very rapid. And that's exactly the same thing that happened during the Grand Canyon. There's a lot of other things we can get into, but the Bible says here they were willingly ignorant of creation. They were willingly ignorant of the worldwide flood. And even that things now, things we have today, are being reserved unto fire against the day of judgment. When there is willing ignorance, it keeps us from learning the truth. And the Bible says it is the truth that sets us free. Amen. But you know there are even some Christians who are willingly ignorant. And I'm not talking about creation and the flood. I'm talking about things the scriptures teach. 1 Corinthians and chapter 14. These are the chapters, chapter 12, 13, and 14 is where Paul was talking to the church about the spiritual gifts and how the church was using spiritual gifts in a wrong way. And he was rebuking them for it. But listen to what he says here. In 1 Corinthians 14 and verse uh, 37, he says, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. What's Paul mean by that? If any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. He's saying here, even to Christians, there are some people who are just dumb on purpose. They don't want to know the truth. They don't want to be convinced of the truth. They believe their own thinking. They've been convinced of their own way for so long that they are not going to learn and submit to the righteousness of God. That's what it's saying there. If they're going to be ignorant, let them continue to be ignorant. This is why there's so many different types of Christianity today. You won't find a whole bunch of different types of Hinduism. You won't find a whole bunch of different types of Buddhism, Mormonism. You won't even find a whole bunch of different types of uh, you know, Islam. Why? Because the devil has those religions wrapped up. But when it comes to Christianity, he's going to try to deceive as many people as he possibly can. Why? Because Christianity, Bible Christianity, is the only religion in the world where you don't have to earn your righteousness because you can. It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It is by faith that we get to heaven. By faith in the shed blood of Jesus. Every other religion in the world, and even some Christian faiths, Teach a works type salvation. You have to do something to get your way there. That's not Bible. That's false doctrine. They do err not knowing the scriptures. You see, God does not want us to be ignorant 
He wants this ignorance to be fixed. But whose responsibility is it? Well, partly it's my responsibility. Partly it's other preachers' responsibility. Our job is to tell you the truth. Our job is to encourage you, hey, get in the Word of God, know the Word of God. But it is your responsibility to search the Scriptures whether these things are so. We have an individual responsibility. God does not want us to be ignorant. And we're going to look at tonight, there's a lot of things he doesn't want us to be ignorant of. And some of them are pretty exciting. I love the things that uh, he says, being not ignorant of this thing. And then he gives us what it is. It's exciting. It's awesome to look at all these things. But if you're ignorant of the way to heaven, there is no hope for you until you're willing to submit to what God says in his word. You'll have no hope. You're going to have a, an eternity in the lake of fire. I don't tell you that because it pleases me. I just tell you that because it's truthful. But if you submit yourself to the teachings of the word of God, the Bible teaches us that there is only one way to heaven. And that is through Jesus Christ. He is the only way there. And if you have been, if you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus, and you've asked the Lord to save you, you say, yes, I know that I'm a Christian. How, how is your Christian life? Are you erring because you don't know the scriptures? Are you, have you convinced yourself of some truths? I did that. I convinced myself of some truths that I found out later. Well, that's not true. That's not what the Bible teaches. But I convinced myself of it. Why? Because I did not know the scriptures. If that's you, guess what you need to do? Lord, I need you to guide me. I need you to instruct me. That's what the Holy Spirit will do. He will guide and lead you into all truth. Will you submit to that? Will you let the Lord have his way in your life and just lead you into truth? Let's all stand. We'll have a word of prayer. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to accept the Lord. The Bible tells us that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants you to know the way of salvation. He doesn't want you to be ignorant of it. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, as we get ready to pray, let me just ask you a question. If you were to die today, do you know for sure, beyond any shadow of a doubt, that you would go to heaven? If you know that because you have asked the Lord to save you, you can remember the time that you asked Christ to save you. You may not remember the day nor the hour, but you can remember maybe where you were or who you were talking to or, or what took place. You can remember that moment. That you ask Jesus to save you. If that's you and you can do that, would you indicate that by lifting your hand real high? Put it right back down. Now, I can't see every hand. I thank you, though. But if you can't remember that time, God wants you to know that you have a home in heaven. Because there's no joy, there's no peace if you don't know. If you just hope so or think so, God does not want you to be ignorant of that. He wants you to receive that knowledge. And it's not what this church just teaches. That's, that doesn't matter. It's what the Bible says. The Bible says that we all are sinners. Every one of us. Nobody's better than anybody else. We all, because we're sinners, we deserve God's wrath. We deserve hell and a lake of fire. That's the wages of sin. It's death. Spiritual death. And the Bible tells us also that Jesus Christ... He knew we could not save ourselves, but he chose to come to this earth. He was God in human flesh, lived a sinless life, shed his blood on the cross to pay for our sins, and then rose from the dead the third day to conquer that last enemy that needed to be destroyed, which was death. He proved that he was God by doing that. And if you will put your faith and trust in him and simply ask him to save you and forgive you your sins, you too can have a home in heaven. Now, if you didn't raise your hand a moment ago, again, I couldn't see every hand, but you're concerned enough about your own soul, and you say, you know, I don't think I've ever done that before, or maybe you have done it before, but you just, you aren't sure, and you want to get it settled. Would you be willing to do that right now? You can pray a simple prayer like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And as best I know how, I'm asking you to save me and take me to heaven when I die. And if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, it's not the prayer that saves you. It's the faith that God saw in your heart. 
But if you prayed that prayer right now and just asked the Lord to save you, I wonder, would you indicate that by lifting your hand real high? Anybody like that? Say, yes, I asked Jesus to save me. Anybody like that? Keep it up real high, I can. I'm looking around. Now, Christian, how about you? Are there some things that you're ignorant of God wants you to know about? Father, we thank you so much for the blessings that you've given to us. And Lord, we thank you for the instruction you have from the Word of God. And, and Lord, we all, I think, are guilty. We all could learn a little bit more than what we have. And we can be a little more diligent in our Bible study and, and in our time with you, walking with you each and every day. But Father, I pray that you will instruct us because, Lord, without you, we can do nothing. But with you, we can do all things. So, Lord, I pray that you will instruct us. And, Lord, if there was one that couldn't raise their hand a little bit ago and, and say that they knew for sure they had a home in heaven because they've done what the Bible says. You said in John 14 that Jesus, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Lord, if there's one watching or listening, Lord, I pray that if they've not accepted Jesus as their Savior, that they'll do that here this morning. Father, we ask you to bless this invitation time. We ask it in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 247. 247. We're going to sing a few verses. Won't you come? God spoke to your heart. The altar's open. You might want to come pray for these names up here on these cards. And you're invited to come as we sing. service here in a word of prayer. God bless you. Uh, I think the uh, sun's starting to try to make its way out, so enjoy the rest of your day. I'll be back in your place tonight, 730. Uh, teenagers, don't forget, teen meeting at 630. And uh, and we have a special tonight. Y'all have a special tonight? Okay. We got a special tonight as well. So let's close the service here in a word of prayer. I'm going to ask CA if he'd mind closing in prayer, please.